Hey people, it's Siobhan here just dropping in at the start of this special episode with Patrice Jones with a quick message. Um, Patrice and I recorded her interview while we were at a writing retreat for Animal Studies Scholars. It was an absolutely amazing weekend with really fascinating thinkers and theorists and advocates. Uh, but we chose to record the episode just as an amazing storm was rolling in. And about three quarters of the way through the recording, the skies opened up. And even though we were sitting on a veranda under an awning, the water just started streaming in. The podcasting equipment started getting wet and then everything just shut down. So this episode is a little bit disjointed. Patrice kindly agreed to redo the end section the next day, but the first half of the interview cuts out at a very strange part, a very strange place, and I didn't want to lose too much of Patrice's insight, so I didn't want to cut it back too much. So listen out for the rain coming in, then it'll end very suddenly, and then suddenly we'll be back as though nothing happened. And that's because we scurried for cover and then recorded the second half the next day. So enjoy this episode of Knowing Animals. Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan does like knowing animals. Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan does like knowing animals. people. Welcome to Knowing Animals. My name's Siobhan O'Sullivan and I do like Knowing Animals. Well, this episode of Knowing Animals is from our Protecting Animals series where we talk to animal advocates past and present about the work they do for animals. Now, this episode of Knowing Animals is brought to you by ASA. ASA is the Australasian Animal Studies Association. I mention ASA at the top of every episode. Have you followed my instructions and liked them on Facebook? Have you gone and checked out their website? Most importantly, have you thought about becoming a member? Membership makes it easier for ASA to serve you, animal studies scholars and animal advocates. So please think about joining ASA, the Australasian Animal Studies Association. Okay, let's get down to the important business of this episode. I have a fabulous guest with me this week. Um, We are in a rural bush setting in New South Wales, about two hours south of Sydney. A fabulous electrical storm is rolling in. And at the same time, because it's almost dusk, the kangaroos and wombats and other animals are starting to gather. So we're in an absolutely magical place. And my guest is not Australian, but no stranger to being surrounded by the sounds and movement of animals. So this week I'm joined by Patrice Jones. Patrice is a writer, educator, activist, and she also co-founded Vine Sanctuary in the US. Many, many listeners will be familiar with Vine. I'm sure like me, you follow them online and, and, and understand the important work they do. So welcome to the podcast, Patrice. Thank you so much, Siobhan. So Patrice, what, inv- what inspired you to get involved in animal protection? <laughs> That's such a hard question. Um... Uh, for many, many, many years of my life, I was a vegetarian but not vegan, s- what we would now call social justice activist. Um, beginning in the 1970s, I did work on uh, gay and lesbian liberation. I was an AIDS activist. I was a housing activist. I worked at a center for anti-racist education. I did feminist work of various kinds. Um, all the time, all the while not eating animals, uh, but thinking of that as a personal choice and still eating animal products, thinking of that as a kind choice. And, uh, then there was a, a, a confluence of circumstances that led me to uh, begin to incorporate animals into my analysis of injustice. So on the one hand, 
as a scholar, I began to understand that the things I was trying to understand about the historical origins of sexism and racism could not be understood unless I also thought about the uh, what we now might call speciesism. Um, I was trying to understand how it was that one group of human beings came to think of themselves as separate from and superior to another set of human beings. But I found that I really couldn't do that unless I was also thinking about how it came to be that human beings uh, came to think of themselves as separate from and superior to all other animals. Uh, at the same time, I was, through a series of happenstances, being exposed to more and more information about animal agriculture in the United States. Um, and so there was this sort of confluence that led me to begin to go vegan. Um, and then, entirely by accident, my former partner Miriam Jones and I, she was, by the way, the person responsible for all of the animal educational material coming in to our house by means of donations to various organizations. Uh, we moved to uh, the part of the country, the part of the United States where factory farming of chickens was invented and perfected. And we found a chicken by the side of the road. And we took the chicken home and we called the local animal shelters and the one that picked up the phone uh, I asked uh, I, I said I found a chicken what should I do uh, she said have a nice dinner and so then this chicken became our responsibility became our friend uh, inspired me to then uh, go into some of the local farms and bring out some other chickens uh, and we started a refuge for chickens on a tiny little plot of land literally surrounded by factory farms um, that was in 2000 18 19 years later we are a sanctuary with more than 600 non-human animal residents, including cows and goats and sheep and, of course, many, many chickens, but also pigeons and doves and turkeys and ducks and geese and guinea fowl and emus um, in rural Vermont, a center of dairying in the United States. So we did ro relocate from a, a center of poultry production to a center of dairy production, um, mostly because we wanted to offer refuge to survivors of dairying who are particularly important to us as feminists. And since we are an animal sanctuary that was founded by deeply experienced social justice activists who began the animal work already having a theory of... Um, social problems that would be called intersectional where we understand that the different forms of, of oppression among humans are linked to one another. Uh, it wasn't very hard for us from the very beginning to then have a theory of uh, animal protection in which we understood that um, the ways we mistreat animals are deeply linked to uh, the ways that we mistreat each other and the earth. Yeah, I mean, it's been just wonderful the last few days getting to know you and hearing about the work that you're doing with Vine, and it is very intersectional. And I'm really uh, fascinated to hear more about the kind of community outreach and the ways in which you bring other issues into play. But just to continue on the animal story in particular for the minute, can you say a little bit about how you say, establish the sanctuary on the land that you're on at the minute? What kind of planning or thought or preparation went into that? <laughs> so the original foundation of the sanctuary, of course, was accidental and organic. Uh, so then we, we grew organically. Uh, then we did relocate. Uh, I'm not quite sure what you're asking well one of the themes that came out because I should say in this conference we had quite a few people who um 
would also run sanctuaries and there was a notion that it, it kind of it happened in a way that perhaps wasn't as strategic or planned out as as it could have been and so I'm interested in hearing you know you, you start with one chicken and now you've got such a large sanctuary did you have priorities did you think right we need to get a particular type of land or we need to engage a particular type of people or hone our skill set sure well we 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 knew from originally being located in a center of poultry uh, production that it's important for animal sanctuaries to be located in these rural regions where uh, animal exploitation is happening um, and to really come to understand those communities and 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 uh, hopefully be part of figuring out how to transition those rural regions into vibrant plant-based agricultural economies. So we uh, we knew that there were not any farmed animal sanctuaries in Vermont which is a state in the United States uh, and is a state which is sort of defined by dairying. Uh, it's a very important part of the state's economy, but also a, an important part of the state's ideology and psychology. Uh, and there were not any farmed animal sanctuaries there. So we chose that state. Uh, we chose a property. At the time we moved, we were just birds. So we chose a property that where we could replicate what we had already done with the birds uh, that was adjacent to a disused farm, which would be the right kind of property for a large animal sanctuary. And then we set about finding the funds. Wonderful. And so... One of the themes that, again, has come out of the conference, for me, certainly talking to yourself and other people actually living with animals, working with animals, is the importance or the significance of getting to know animals in a very profound way. And you opened the conference with a wonderful paper about your relationship with emus. Can you say something about what it's meant for you to really engage in a very profound and ongoing way with non-human animals? I can try to say something about that. Uh, a lot of it is not verbal because while animals certainly do uh, communicate uh, and use sounds to communicate, um, and some, like birds, even have uh, grammars of sounds that are fairly somewhat similar to our words and grammars uh, for the most part animals aren't using words in the way that we use words and so at least for me I, I often find that it's it can be difficult to find a language to express the experiences that I have in relationship with non-human animals and a big part of what I see as my job is sort of finding language to say the things that I've learned and then and then and then go say those things uh, to people uh, and so certainly if you um, if you try to be in real relationship with non-human animals then that's going to require a certain um, setting aside of human hubris and a certain um, effort to uh, undo the separation between humans and animals that humans have created through our ideology of human supremacy or speciesism, and to see yourself as simply one among other animals and um, and then the task is a task of empathy, not unlike when you are attempting to forge relationship with another human, which is to do your best to sort of see things from their perspective, do your best to be honest, do your best to communicate in ways that they will understand, again, honestly, and maybe um, also imagine how they see you wonderful so patrice you are very oh, oh wait and then all of that doing all, so you have to set aside human hubris a little bit to 
to begin that process. And if you do that process, then that really strips away the human hubris. Yeah. Wonderful. So Patrice, you are very committed, as you said, to a whole raft of social justice um, principles. Can you say something about how Vine gives real um, meaning to things like, you know, intersectionality, decolonization, um, you know, feminism, et cetera, how, how you live that or express that through the sanctuary? Sure. Uh, I, 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 there are lots of different ways that our uh, commitments inform not only the, let's say, events and educational efforts that the sanctuary pursues, but, but even how we structure the sanctuary itself. Uh, so we are um, uh, very interested in... Um, now I'm gonna I'll, I'm gonna take back those first words of that sentence, and I'll I'll go I'll say the easier things first. So Please. we are an LGBTQ founded um, animal sanctuary, so we do make an effort uh, to uh, to talk about that. Um, we also make an effort to talk about queer animals and all of the ways that animals are queer. We make an effort to, um, of course, we promote. Um, plant-based eating in LGBTQ communities, but that's not all. Uh, we're also really interested in being a place where LGBTQ youth can come do some volunteer work that's really meaningful, but also healing. Um, we are in a very small uh, town in a rural region without a lot of money, so actually every year our Pride event is the only pr gay Pride event in our town. Uh, we also uh, then spreading that out to other education. So we will we will put on educational efforts, uh, say at the show a film at the local library, or do a talk at the local Unitarian church. And oftentimes these will be um, the we will be the only folks in our community uh, who are um, talking about the prison industrial complex or putting together an anti racist educational event. Um, yeah, wonderful. So one of the other themes that came out in the conference and that um, you've mentioned to me in our private discussions is around grief and managing grief and, and the, you know, the reality that grief is part of having a sanctuary. Can you say something about how grief, you know, manifests and how, how you think about it and deal with it and work through it? Sure. I, I, this may be one of the areas where sanctuary folks have um, some experience that might be useful for other folks. Um, and, um, and one of the things I'll just say that I was very glad about this recent conference uh, is that there was an incorporation of sanctuary folk in with the animal studies folk. Um, people who look at sanctuary from the outside, they will imagine, I guess, that you're mostly spending your time, I guess, lolling about and petting animals or something, uh, as opposed to doing a lot of hard manual physical labor every single day no matter what you feel like or what the weather is like and that there's not a lot of time for lolling about um, and that you certainly are I, I don't want to uh, understate the gift that it is to be in relation to non-human animals and to have a life where you're having a conversation with someone and then some ducks walk by and then another minute later a sheep comes up and joins the conversation and uh, this, this is very rich and I don't mean to, to denigrate that but sanctuary work is also really hard um, and probably the hardest part for most people is the grief uh, because uh, people die. Sanctuary residents die. Uh, uh, many, if not most, come in following 
some forms of trauma that have weakened their bodies. They might have survived factory farms. They might have survived some form of abuse or neglect. They might have gone through some period of starvation that will leave its mark on the body even after they seem completely healthy. Uh, They may have some underlying heart problems because of the earlier trauma. Wow. Uh, Yeah, I love this thunder. Um, And I've been loving these birds flying by as we've been talking. it's beautiful. And I can see the kangaroos just off in the distance. They're just making their way out. I saw this beautiful red bird uh, who I didn't know. Um, So uh, there's a lot of death. I, I literally cannot tell you how many hundreds of birds have died in my arms. Uh and that does n- n- you can't stop to grieve and yet you must feel your feelings because if you lock them away they're going to pop out some other way um if you numb yourself to them then you're going to be numbing yourself to the other animals and maybe not being as good a caregiver as you would be so you can't let yourself go on emotional lockdown um and so you do have to find a way to feel the grief and continue on with the work within the grief which is i think a really relevant skill to have in the anthropocene um, and for other kinds of social justice work, the ability to get on with the work, not as if you're not grieving, but within the grief, and to have the grief in some way fuel the work. Mm, you heard me give a talk about emus um, that I prefaced by talking about the death of, of an emu, and... Um, That was a particularly tragic death, a particularly hard death for me. And that then motivated me to just pour that energy into trying to do right by her. Wonderful. So Patrice, I'm absolutely certain that there will be many people listening to this episode who admire you personally, who admire the work of Vine Sanctuary and who themselves dream of perhaps having a sanctuary themselves. I know that there must be so much to running a sanctuary, but do you have some words of wisdom or some kind of um, insight you'd like to share with people who are thinking that for them the path is to have their own sanctuary? I would, I have a lot of things to say about that. And so I would check the, um, the Vine Sanctuary blog because I, I, I believe that I have written at least one and perhaps two pieces specifically on uh, the things that you should think about. And I know that a lot of other people like Farm Sanctuary do a much better job than I would do uh, uh, telling you the kinds of mechanical things you're going to need to think about, like funding and learning how to take well, care of animals. I but I think you also have to figure to out five whether you ready for your five quick you're someone okay. who's <laughs> well-suited Can for that work. When you because there's lots of other ways there was something to help animals. Or wrong about um, the relationship and, between uh, human and non-human animals. It may be animals. that you don't know until you try it, so it may be but involved doing if some you mean interning first, or first, volunteering. First, then I think... I think it's when I was in uh, a child in um, and it was allied with thinking about other things. Interestingly, uh, there was a time when uh, I lived in a si- in Baltimore City in the United States in a very small what we call row home. They had little yards. Um, and one other child on my street had pushed us all out saying, get off our, you're on our property, get off our property. And this then led me to really, really be thinking about this whole question of property. And I remember stepping on and off of a public sidewalk onto a private yard thinking property, not my property, property, not property. And it just seems so wrong. And it, it was, so it was, um, 
and 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 then my mind like flashed back to the um what we what I would have thought of as the pilgrims um the the settlers and they had their funny hats and their muskets in my mind and they were using their guns um to say this is my property and and then I visualized them building a fence or a, a wall of some kind and then I was thinking that this was wrong that just because they had guns that they could make something into property and it so it was mostly about property but I remember that in my mind I was also imagining squirrels and the wall that the pilgrim was building because he had a gun and thinking that did that mean that he owned the squirrel and that that was really wrong wow how amazing what a fabulous journey goodness Patrice can you recall the first thing you did to try and bring about change for animals um Well, the first time I advocated for any animal was around the same time uh, when some boys at uh, school on a day that was not a school day, uh, we were all there and there were windows that had like bars over them and there was a big insect that we call a praying mantis. I don't know if you have them here. Yes, yeah, so there was a praying mantis. Um, which I had never seen, but I'd never seen such a glorious um, being before. And these boys then were throwing rocks at her. And I w remember I was so scared um, in my own body uh, for her, and I couldn't think what to do. And so then I told them that she was an endangered species and that if they didn't stop, the police were going to come. Um, <laughs> did the police come? <laughs> <laughs> the police did not come, but I was trying to get them to, yeah. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> and I think it must have been that the Endangered Species Act had just been passed or, or something, yeah. Yeah, right. Wow. Yeah. Well, Patrice, the next question is a bit of a tricky one because I'm interviewing you under the auspice of the Protecting Animal series, mm. but I know that you're also a scholar and a writer. Mm. So I'm happy for you to kind of answer this question in whatever way, you know, mm. speaks to you best. So the way I've got it written down here is if you had to name one animal advocate who's had a big impact on you, who would it be? Mm. But equally, if you'd like to name one animal studies scholar that's had a big impact on you or perhaps one from each category. I'm very happy to hear, you know, whatever thoughts come to your mind. Well, it's really hard to choose one because um, uh, I, I guess this is the way everyone's mind works, but I'm really aware that it, it that what happens is anytime I have any kind of conversation with anybody or read any book or listen to any talk or speech that this goes into my brain and, and then it mm, rattles around and mutates with the other things in the brain that have come from all of my past experiences. And so I'm always hesitating uh, to claim my, my ideas as mine in any way. Um, and similarly to then say, well, here, there's this one person's ideas, uh, who, or actions who influenced me is really hard, but I, I do want to, I guess I want to give a shout out, uh, to, um, the co-founder of Vine Sanctuary, Miriam Jones, um, who, uh, of course our project evolved in constant conversation with each other. And it's just through happenstance that I am mostly the one who, does a lot of the talking uh, on behalf of the sanctuary, and so I get a lot of credit for ideas that really evolved in conversation. Um, and then on the animal scholar side, I guess Lori Gruen and I are a co in constant conversation, and and certainly those conversations have developed my thinking. Oh, wonderful! Very, very fitting people and women. What's the most important thing animal advocates can do for animals? Oh, there's not one. I th the most important thing you can do is know that there's not one. Okay, wonderful. Important yes, now I agree with you completely. So if you had the power to change one thing about the human, non-human animal relationship, what would it be? I guess I would um, enable the human... Uh, I would enable people who are humans uh, who are so 
currently estranged from other animals as to feel themselves apart and superior, but it's also a terrible, terrible estrangement. Um, and at the sanctuary sometimes, or just, it, it's possible to sort of um, not be separate or at least feel what it would be like to be truly in community with other animals and not feel like anything other than just another of the animals. Um, so I guess I, I would make it easier for all of us to do that. Wonderful. Well, Patrice, I'm going to ask what are you working on next, but let me preface it by saying I know that you are working on lots and lots of different things, so please feel free to talk about either sanctuary-related projects or your scholarship or your writing. <laughs> I think I forgot that you were going to ask that question. Um, so the sanctuary has lots of projects, and I would just encourage people to check us out on social media. Um, uh, I'm working on one a uh, piece of writing, uh, probably a book that is called Human Error, um, that looks at the ways that speciesism uh, not only confuses us about animals, but confuses us about ourselves, and, and suggests that the confusions that we have about ourselves, what kind of animals we are, um, because that's part of speciesism is be, is not just lies about other animals, but lies about who we are. Um, but we've believed those lies. We've been hypnotized by those lies. And I, and I think that we, the errors that we make in thinking about, about what humans are like and what motivates humans, um, are errors that not only hurt animals, but also are exactly the errors that have made certain problems so intractable for us to solve. Wow. And so this would be then something that I would hope that activists of all stripes could make use of. So, Patrice, how can people find out more about you, your work, and also the sanctuary? Ah, well, you can go to vinesanctuary.org uh, to find the sanctuary in all of its manifestations. And uh, for me, I'm really lucky in that my name is unique in its spelling so if you just google me you'll find a lot of the writings wonderful well patrice thank you so much for joining us and thank you to thank the you so much Siobhan. thank you patrice yeah it's been just wonderful and the, this whole conference has been absolutely amazing so it's just been so wonderful to also be in conversation with you for a couple of days and so i'd like to thank you and i'd also like to thank the listeners for joining us for knowing animals the podcast where we speak to animal um, study scholars and animal advocates about the work they do for animals. I'm Siobhan O'Sullivan and I do like knowing animals.